the project Evan and I are, are working under right now. So we have an NSF grant to try to reconstruct climate over the Northern Great Plains. And previously, these red cedars that turn out to be very old have been completely unrecognized for what they are. We're not having any trouble going to any random cliffside site and getting trees to go back to the 1400s. So we're looking for eastern red cedar trees and there's a, a number of reasons that that is a specific species that we're seeking. And there's a bunch of other information that's going to come out of this whole process that's also super interesting. And so James has been really good at talking about like, this is old growth and we need to start thinking about like this as a patch of old growth. Are the trees over 100 years old? Is there coarse woody debris? Are there unique plant communities? And it's like they fit everything, right? When you start to look at cedars, their their physical appearance is going to start telling you about how hard has it been, how long have they been there. It's like this one right here. So when you look at it, it's got a pretty straight trunk. Um, you can start to see a little bit of spiral, how the bark's starting to turn around it a little bit. Um, the branches, when I look at these, I say, okay, those are actually, those are fairly thick branches for a cedar tree. And at the same time, a cedar tree that tall tells me that it has never grown in super scorched conditions. Um, that it doesn't have a lot of spiral tells me that it's not really old. Um, it's got a continuous canopy to the top. That tells me that it's never grown high and then been pushed back by a severe drought. Um, that it wasn't able to pull water up to that top. When you start to see the old ones, you look right at that edge, right? They're almost like a bush or bonsai um, because they have not been able to grow tall because they can't get enough water and they've been wind blasted and scorched by the sun. You're gonna start to see that their, their bark kind of spirals around over here. This one is starting to do that. You, um, that is a characteristic of old trees of almost every species that I, I think, um, at least with rough bark. So whether it's oaks, hickories, or in this case, cedar, is that when they're young, the bark is vertical and smooth and they're gonna to get to a point where they keep growing, but they're not getting taller. And it's like that wood and all the stress in their body starts to, to spiral this grain. And so if you ever see a spiral grain, um, you know it's an older tree. And so on some of these young ones, that one over there, you've got, um, if you look up, like there's all these different leaders, in that case, probably because they kept dying back from drought you're starting to get spiral grain. And then the other thing that cedars do um, that's really dis distinct for them here is they will, um, if a root or branch dies, that part of the trunk might stop growing. The cambium stops cell division. It is essentially dead, but these trees are really good at compartmentalizing that injury. And so that's why like this tree is mostly round, which tells me it's not that old. As we go through here, um, you're going to start to see, I think, some of these trees where it's like the center of the tree, the pith, is like here, but all of the tree is grown over here because this stuff died 150 years ago and the tree just kept growing and, and I was fine with that. And so it just it expresses that resilience. So then you layer on top of all of that, the, especially along this edge, thin soils, south facing slope, super parched which means that with these trees um, and you think about what are the factors that are going to most strongly limit to their growth um, and you start thinking about how rare water is in those conditions and what that means is that if you have a year like this year where it just rains and rains and rains that even though there's very little soil they've never had a dry day They've always had enough water. And especially when you're on a hot site, trees use a lot of water evaporation to keep cool so that their leaves are photosynthesizing at kind of peak efficiency. And so far this year now, this has been a good year for cedars. Not even just because we've gotten so much rain, but because it's been so evenly spaced. Just all of these days of rain where they've never had to dry out. So in this case, like those trees will put on a wide ring. Absolutely, it's plenty hot, but they've got enough water. And so they're gonna grow. Um, you know, go to a couple of the droughts recent years, man, when you have 30 or 35 days without rain, these trees are just getting parched. 
And so because they don't have water to photosynthesize efficiently, they're not gonna produce as much sugar, which means that they don't have as much for that year's growth or the next, which means narrowing. And so what we're finding is that the signature of wide and narrow rings um, that is shared by cedar trees across the Driftless area is incredibly well synced with how much rain fell at that location. Then you add on the fact that these trees, if they're not burned off, which again, like right on the edge of that rock, like that's where the, if there was a prairie fire here 150 years ago, 200 years ago, would have run up the slope. It's fine fuel, so the heat's gone in a flash going to wrap around these rocks, but sitting on that rock edge means that they're never going to be surrounded by heat long enough to girdle the trunk. Um, and so these are the tiny little nooks and crannies that they could hang on. And you layer all this on and all of a sudden you're talking about trees that we're finding have been alive for four or 500 years, 600 years. And then the things that the, the trees that died, um, whether they died from drought, fire, old age. A lot of times we're finding stumps because timber was so scarce back in the day. Um, but then it's red cedar, so it doesn't rot. And so we're finding stumps that were cut in the 1810s that were of trees that were 400 years old and it's totally solid. And so all of a sudden you've got tree rings that go back to the 1400s um, that are each carrying that pattern of wide and narrow and wide and narrow, which then all of a sudden becomes basically a rain gauge that goes back for centuries. And so now you put yourself in like today, hotter summers, you have this really interesting trend where you actually have wetening in this part of the world where we're getting more and more rainfall over the last 30 years. And if you look, it's just, it's just climbing up. And we have no precedent for that in the last 150 years, which is what our climate record span. And so that's the conversation, right? Okay, so is this just a thing? Cycles? Is it the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean pushing us into some sort of long-term high precipitation event? It can happen. El Nino, everybody knows about, but what about the Pacific Decadal Oscillation or the, multi, or the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation that kind of push these long-term trends? So that could be part of it but we don't know and we can't know because we don't have the records in all of the places that we need them to push back. And so people have used tree rings to look at this for a long time in a lot of different places. Um, out West, you got like, who's heard of bristlecone pine, right? Or old ponderosa pine or dug fir or some of these trees that we know live for a long time, sequoia. Um, so we have these long records there. In the east, on the southeast, we've got some really old bald cypress tree ring data sets that go back literally thousands of years. Again, a rot resistant tree that's been hiding away in these like places that people don't really want to go. And that's how it's list lasted for so long. But in the upper Midwest, we've got we got some old oak trees that are several hundred years old. And that's great. Like 300 year old tree is amazing. Um, James can tell you about northern white cedar on the on the Niagara escarpment up in Door County. That, those things, again, like they're hanging out in these places that people haven't really gone. And so those have gotten really old. But right here, you're looking at kind of the longest term record, biological record of growing conditions that you're going to find anywhere. And it's, it has not been done. And so we're literally living in the shadows of these old growth forests that are like all around us that are carrying all this climate information. And so our part of the project is looking here. We've got collaborators working in the southeast. Um, wrapping around into the southwest, kind of trying to get a handle all around the Great Plains where there aren't a lot of tree ring records because that's where we grow so much of our food. And if you look at climate records as they exist, um, there is this increasing contrast where the northern plains are getting wetter and the southern plains are getting drier. Um, we've got uh, potentially an increase in occurrence of what are called flash droughts where it's really rapid onset. Those are not normal droughts. Normal droughts take a while to establish. And you think about how dry we were and how wet we are now, like how do you flip that much? Um, and so the only way that we have right now to look at these same cycles and events and processes over multiple centuries, that's tree rings and in this case it's cedars. And so this project is telling us about how old these trees are. It's telling you about the ecology and history of this site. It's linking it with 
fire occurrence, which is a fundamental expression of human engagement with the landscape over millennia. Um, it's diversity, it's climate records, it's conservation and stewardship, and it's trying to figure out what has happened over the last 500,000 years to get as well prepared as possible for understanding where we are going. And then whatever opinions on climate change you have, if you are anti-planning, then you are living in a very dangerous world. This is the only way we have a better sense of kind of where we're going. And so these data then are what we have to now develop broad reconstructions. Um, we don't have local data from the driftless that are comparable to this. So these are new and unprecedented for this place and they fit into this broader network that's now telling us more and more about climate across this whole region. And then with those data sets, you now have an ability to refine your computer models so that you can better understand what are the processes that are playing out. And with those models, that's what you can then cast forward and predict and figure out what you need to do to plan for a climate future that we haven't seen before. So that's the pith. This is where it died back here. Mm -hmm. And this is where it kept growing. And so you've got 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 200. The rings are pretty tight right here. So we're probably gonna have 250 to 300 rings in this. <laughs> cool.